Welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jorge Otero Pilos, and I am the director of the Historic Preservation Program here at GSAP. And tonight, I want to welcome you to the Paul S. Byard Memorial Lecture, which will be delivered this year by Cecilia Puga and Paula Velasco directly from their studio in Santiago de Chile. I want to acknowledge the support of Platt Byard Deval White Architects for this lecture over the years and that of Rosalie Byard. And we are grateful for your generosity. In a 2018 interview, Cecilia Puga was asked to answer a simple question that has no easy answer. What are you trying to achieve with your work? Asked the journalist. Her answer was as startling and unique as her buildings. A ruin, she said. So how can an architect wish to achieve a ruin? Her answer stands in sharp contrast to those we've become accustomed to hearing, almost as cliches, such as, I want to achieve sustainability or social justice or, or beauty. By the way, she could have answered any of those things and the interviewer would have been satisfied because the buildings that she designs together with her partner, Paula Velasco, achieve those goals too, of course. But those goals are secondary to what Puga and Velasco are after. They insist they want to achieve ruins. Now, needless to say, from a business development standpoint, this is not a great way to get clients, especially in Chile, a land vexed by earthquakes that regularly reduce buildings to ruins. The whole emphasis of the profession is to prevent ruins from happening. But insofar as Puga and Velasco's work insist on the pursuit of ruins, it really cuts against the grain of the profession in a fundamental way. Now to be sure, Puga and Velasco's buildings are not meant to fall down during earthquakes. That's not the kind of ruin they want to achieve. That's the vulgar ruin, the ruin as rubble, the ruin as senseless aftermath of catastrophe. For them, a ruin is an idea, a concept that describes the elements of a building that are most resistant, that endure over time. The designs of Puga and Velasco pursue the ruin because they are after the toughest, the most resistant, the most enduring aspects of architecture. The ruin for them is an intention, a goal, as well as a form of attention a compass that they return to, to orient their work. But where is that compass? Or more importantly, we may ask, what form does that compass take? It takes the form of other buildings, existing buildings, old buildings, the buildings that have lasted, the buildings that have survived the assault of time, of ignorance and even neglect. These buildings have lessons to teach about what it takes to endure, to last. And Puga and Velasco pay attention to those old buildings. They study them, they listen to them. And most importantly, they respond to them with their own buildings. And this dialogue between old and new expressed through architecture is something that Paul Byard understood and devoted his life to. Byard was an architect, a lawyer, and for many years, director of the Historic Preservation Program at GSAP. For him, a dialogue did not mean agreement. A dialogue could be an argument over a disagreement. As a lawyer, he was a master of debating in print. As an architect, he could express an argument architecturally like no other. Above all, Bayard believed that arguments have to be based on principled arguments and never on personal whimsy. Through his books and his buildings, he showed that old buildings make arguments about the world. And those arguments change over time. And why we, while we might disagree with those arguments, if they're principled and well-supported, they should have the right to express them. And Bayard, you can tell, was an advocate for freedom of speech. And buildings for him were sophisticated forms of human communication. He wrote, quote, 
protecting their expression requires a capacity to appreciate the interaction of the successive proposals buildings inevitably make about themselves and about each other over time, the impacts of architecture on architecture, and to make principled judgments about the way they should change in light of the public's enduring need to have access to particular protected meanings. Now note how Bayard introduced the public here as a kind of jury listening to the arguments that buildings make about each other. There's much of the legal mind here. Architecture, he insisted, should serve the public interest and the public should be the judge of what lasts and what doesn't, what to preserve and what to let go of. Or to use Puga and Velasco's idea, what will rise to the level of a ruin and what won't. Puga and Velasco's mastery of architectural expression, their ability to engage with existing buildings through their designs, has earned them important awards and recognition in Chile and internationally. They've also won major competitions, including the infrastructure design project for Cuelat National Park, the master plan and preliminary project for Punta Arenas International Passenger Terminal, in the Chilean Pavilion for Expo Dubai 2020, this last project in association with architect Smiljan Radic. Tonight, they will present the recently completed headquarters of Chile's Ministry of Cultures and Heritage. The project, which I had the privilege of seeing in a trip last year to Chile, is a masterful dialogue between old and new in a fitting tribute to the memory of Paul Bayard. It's an honor to welcome Cecilia Puga and Paula Velasco to Columbia University and to the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Please join me virtually as you may in joining uh, in welcoming them very warmly to our podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge, for your beautiful introduction. We are very honored to be part of the Paul Bayer Memorial Lecture today with Paula Velasco. And we really want to thank you and all the team of the Historical Preservation Program for having invited us today. Uh, what we will show you is a single project we have just finished, as Jorge said just uh, before. And, but first of all, we want to, to tell you a little bit about the context in which this building is now uh, finished. We find our, our, ourselves now in Chile in the middle of a historical process, a deep crisis that started in October 2019, which marches and street riot then led to debate, decisions, and an important citizen referendum that has left us in charge of preparing a new political constitution for our country. It will replace the 1980 constitution rewritten and imposed under dictatorship. In April 20, uh, 2021, Chileans will go to the poll once again to elect the members of a constituent assembly made up of citizens, politicians, and independent. For the first time in history, this assembly will ensure gender parity and the presence of representative of native communities. In its work and deliberation session, this democratically elected constitute assembly will occupy two locations in Santiago, one public and the other originally private, the palace of the former National Congress uh, from 1876 and the recently recovered Palacio Pereira. These two buildings were inaugurated in the 19th century already in the Republican period and designed by the French architect Lucien Henault. Both of them raised the neoclassical style that reaches our, our country as a flagship of the value of the enlightenment in the public sphere 
as well as the backdrop for the new socialization of the country's elite. It is therefore quite symbolic that the Chilean state had chosen these two buildings to host the discussion about the basis of our future coexistence. Resisting the private sector intention to turn into real state business, the decision by the state of Chile to recover, restore and conserve the Pereira Palace represented from the beginning the will to democratize a domestic space. Now, that is open into the city is a fact. There has been no lack of controversy. Will we be able to protect this building from the impact of, of a social movement whose energy, rage, and discontent has been partially expressed through the scratching and burning of building? Was it, was it appropriate to remove through an almost surgical operation and hundreds of restorers all the layer of industrial pain that were superimposed on the coating that were still preserved from the second half of the 19th century and thus leave the building raw to the outside? How to protect the work of so many years against an environment that does not prioritize the issue of heritage conservation? Last December, in light of the event in the street of Santiago, Jorge, was invited by the Subsecretaria del Patrimonio Cultural to discuss along with other experts and contemporary views, a proposal for the protection of the Palacio Pereira. We then addressed our ambition to turn the building skin into a surface capable of absorbing the historical moment underway as an art installation that could receive, contain and preserve the mood of the moment while at the same time protecting the building. Our ambition was large and resources were very small. The pandemic ending up throwing ob overboard any attempt on, to conjugate this concern from interaction and registration rather than from repression. The Pereira Palace will be a public space integrated to the capital city of Chile. Its protection and conservation are linked to its reinsertion in the urban programmatic fabric, which through the constituent debate restored this building to the Republican life. So our lecture this, this evening is called Amalgam and Justaposition. We think these two words represent very carefully the operation we have done in the in the old building. In, 1970, in 1872, Senator and businessman Luis Pereira commissioned French architect Lucien Henault the design of an urban mansion for his family. Santiago was then in the process of a rapid modernization the need to build the identity of a new republic that was at the verge of its founding centenary was beginning to promote a serious major public work in the city. Lucien Ambroise Henault was one of several European professionals that the Chilean government appointed to design emblematic work for the new republican institution. Educator under the wing of Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand, Henri Labrouste, and Eugène Violet Le Duc, the three of them captain of the French structural and parametric rationalism, Eno arrived in Chile in 1856. In parallel to his public work, Eno forged link with the local elite and accepted some private commissions, such as Mr. Pereira and his family residence. He developed a building of neoclassical composition using Ionic and Corinthian order with two levels in its main front. Keeping up the continuous facade typical of Santiago foundational quarter, setting up followed the colonial tradition. Typological, it incorporated new uses and distributive system addressing a more integrated and complex stratification of social relations. At the same time, it provided a proper theatr 
theatrical backdrop to the everyday life for the 19th, 18th, 19th century local elite. A transept constitutes the major feature of the plan. It organized and oriented the most significant spaces in the ground floor, leading to a courtyard that occupied the back of the property and separated the services areas from those used by the family. This space acted as a sort of interior street, a place of circulation, encounters, and representation. In all, treated the surfaces of its walls as public facade, using opening, relief, and ornament to create a sense of rhythm and the feeling of an urban scenario. During the first half of the past century, the palace ceased to be a residency. From then on, it underwent different uses, which led to a series of alteration to the building. At the end of the 70s, and shortly after being declared a national monument by the state of Chile, the building entered a phase of decay and abandonment due to a complete lack of maintenance, which produced varying level of deterioration from partial collapse to a wide range of structural and superficial damage. The passing of time provided the building with what Romanticism used to call the sublime. Its material decay suggested a former glory, so inspiring awe and veneration. What had begun as the built expression of an European nice elite acquired through its self-inflicted abandonment the patina of a reality of its own, giving the building a singular place within Santiago's cultural context. The house became a silent testimony of a crumbling social structure. Paradoxically, sometimes a ruin can become more of a process than that of a fixed image. In this case, after 40 years of abandonment, what was left of the Palacio Pereira became a powerful mobilizer of energy, thoughts, and actions. In 2011, the Chilean state, which 155 years earlier had brought enough from Paris to design public building, broke the palace in order to transform it into the headquarters of the recently created Ministry of Culture, Art and Heritage. The following year, Chile's cultural office called for a public architectural competition to restore the historical house and design an extension to host the new institution. Our design team, Cecilia Puga, Paula Velasco, and Alberto Moleto, worked together with a group of advisors and specialists in the field of restoration and structural engineering and consolidation. Alan Chandler from England, Luis Cercos from Spain, Fernando Perez, Pedro Bartolomé, and Christian Sandoval were part of our team. Our proposal got the first prize and the commission of the work. The Pereira Palace competition offered a starting point from which to attempt the meeting of two potential antagonist positions, conservation and renovation. The way in which these two concepts were articulated in the intervention was crucial, to inject life in the building, wrapping, protecting and incorporating its renewed condition. The two positions, one modern, one traditional, inevitably clash at a physical point, and this aspect required the utmost care. The truth of the building is inherent in the vernacular architect so valued by William Morris. However, the articulation of this truth became effectively necessary once our ability to camouflage the, stru the structure and material for symbolic purpose became widespread. Sorry, we have to move on. In no material operation of the Palacio Pereira was clearly theatrical. 
its final expression was willfully orchestrated to generate a backdrop of the increasingly sophisticated social relation of the mid 19th century elites. And was from being intent to express the material truth of the building which the ruin had exposed. The work of the recovering historic building is a constant struggle to reveal and discover, refraining from altering or destroying. Without accepting the radical change that the discovery brings, there would be no interpretation. History shapes our intellectual relationship with the past based on physical and material realities. Modernity is characterized by the standardization of assembly and the tactics of using components, a delicate immaterial aesthetic in contrast to a traditional construction based on intervention that operate through the fitting interconnection and accumulation of operation that seeks to protect soft material through the use of the increasable harder ones. The fashion of both materials reality through painstaking attention to detail cha challenge the polarization of the historical and the modern. Manufactured materials can bring and tie together, as well as adding levels of protection, but they require the tidiness that Morris demand in a way that restore a lively architecture, with the spirit of the past event embedded in its remodeling. The question of how to deal with the materiality of the building, as it was, became key to the project. In selecting the material strategy, the project sought to draw attention to the complexity of enabling a ruin, without prioritizing either the new intervention nor its elegant and decadent nature. Through a delicate material repair that combined contemporary analysis technique seeking to achieve precise specification on mortars, stucos, and masonry, and the eventual use of the super resistant resin and steel to join, suture, and consolidate the construction. The ruins of the building were maintained and consolidated. This allowed for a building in which new activities could take place, answering Morris' call to continue to add layers to the history of the site. The work started in 2016. Palacio Pereira, original structure, underwent a, a thoughtful material restoration that combined contemporary analysis technique to achieve precise specification on mortars, stucos, and masonry. After several months, most of the original fabric had been striped and cleaned. At the same time, the factory wall were in fill and structurally repair. A complete engineering study was done in order to define a structural reinforcement criteria. The aim was to have as few interventions as possible with a small number of accurate operations that may ensure the stability of the building facing future earthquakes. From the beginning, we knew that in addition to the material, historical, and symbolic aspect of the monument, we had to recover and preserve the structural performance of the building. This implied that the structural consolidation has to be done by means of surgical and minimal operation, which we achieved thanks to the fact that the project technical unit accepted that we use the Italian seismic standard instead of the Chilean one, which will have forced us to build a concrete supporting structure throughout the building. In addition to repair the endless crack with metal insert and resins, rigid concrete diagram, di di diaphragm were built on all floors and ceiling, which hold all interior and exterior wall together, allowing the building to work structurally as a whole again. At the same time, the reinforcement of every existing opening with a 10 millimeter thick embedded steel frame, frame that solved the issue of stability that the structure had was introduced. The reinforcement were done, done were really the minimum. The competition rule 
establish three degree of intervention. One refer to the glaze gallery and the facade, where a good part of the finishing and ornament were preserved was defined. In both cases, an intervention were requested that will enhance the original neoclassical ornamental orders and rhythm, and that will carefully recover the historical remain of stucco and molding. Another aim at those spaces that preserved the masonry structure but had lost any original ornamental layer. Here, the intervention had degree of freedom to define the termination without affecting the historical element. Finally, the one referred to the new construction that had occupied the site-free space and in which there was freedom to propose a contemporary and autonomous architecture in relation to the existing building. A preliminary test for the restoration work were conducted on a fragment of the facade in order to gap the implication that the removal of dirt and several layers of paint will imply. After that first field study, we had a clear idea of the original color and the actual state of the surfaces. A careful operation of cleaning was then implemented to reveal the original color of the building obscured behind dust and paint. The same operation also resulted in a survey on the real condition and state of the building surfaces and the amount of Mrs. Ornament, which unveiled the tension between the will of conservation and the needs of renovation. Both in the facade and in the transept, our proposal avoided the massive reconstruction of the lost ornament and limited the reconstruction to the main uh, order element, those that allow us to understand the rhythm and measure of the space conceived by Lucien Henault. We establish that we will only reconstruct clean pilaster capitals and cornices, and that all the rest of the ornament of the secondary order that has been lost will remain as traces and testimony of the passing of time in the body of the building. A significant part of the work in the space of the transept for, were, was meant to restore its wall and recover the, their dense, rich texture. This work were done in the same level and intensity as the exterior envelope, facade, let's say. Several steps of cleaning and removing dust and painting to later dismantle all pieces that may be in risk of falling were done in the first step of the work. The intervention did not aim for a continuous surface, quite the contrary. It looked to stabilize what was left and talk about missing part. Avoiding highlighting fragmentation and detail, looking for visual integrity for a certain distance. Here you can see some details of the renovation. The flooring was another opportunity. The original hard tile were gone, leaving a neutral surface that turned the systematic rational layout of the plan created by rationalist trained and all into a field, a series of equivalent spaces, not direction, no end, no one after the other. The unexpected condition of discontinuous, mute, horizontal surfaces merge equivalent aces into a sequence of non hierarchical spaces, quite different from the rigorously decorated carpet like panel that Eno designed to emphasize the autonomy and self unity of each space, section, and room within the palace. As seen, for instance, in the transept. Our proposal embraces the idea of a flooring scheme that promoted the feeling of an open plan with no direction, undetermined to such a degree that could promote changes and displacement. The floor is seen as a slick surface that opposes 
to the heavily textured ceiling and wall, retaining the atmospheric condition that the ring offered. It resulted in the use of a smooth surface of walnut hardwood floor that runs throughout the interior space and subtract the borderline between individual and collective secondary and hierarchical elements. Roof and ceiling were not original flat texture surface, but three-dimensional elements above the interior space. As a clock hovering above, the concave surface of their edges met the walls creating the feeling of a protected autonomous space. In consonance with the heavily decorated original ceilings, we proposed the use of a seal screen timber ceilings with motifs from the time the palace was built. In some of the salons, we choose William Morris pattern as both quote and homenage. Local artists participate in this job and their craftsmanship was central to the restoration recovering all traders for the architecture. As opposed to the discrete flooring, these ceilings characterize the space of the upper level taking advantage of their close connection to the street and the people in the sidewalks, who will be able to see these motifs from the outside. Fallen floors on the other side had created double height spaces, and it expanded dimension within the rational plan, offer opportunity for the reconfiguration of the overall building. Fallen ceilings and fallen and wall finishing exposed the constructive reality of the existing fabric, leaving it rough work stripped of everything that was perishable and allowing unexpected understanding on the structure and the nature of its construction. In fact, this exposed detailing allow a deeper knowledge on building technique of the time and even its replication and translation to present components. Rather than rebuild the double height boy that appeared after the deck failed, was consolidating as a response to this tension between conservation and renovation. The way in which these two concepts were articulated in the intervention was crucial to inject life in the building, caring, protecting, and embracing its condition of ruin, providing a new sense to this absence and taking the opportunity to introduce present time. The Mansoronary walls are now exposed as a testimony of massive backstage of the regional ornament surface. Whereas two bronze helicoidal staircases complete these vertical spaces and connect to system of walkways that are part of the new circulation that the proposal added to the system. It's polished surface reflect the masonry roughness and differentiation different times and technological context through time, colliding in the space of the work. The third degree of intervention correspond to the new structure insert in the empty area of the plot. Following the footprint of the original typology of the palace, which relate to the transit with the courtyard and its side corridors, the new intervention is responsible for filling the blanks resulting from successive demolition and collapses, giving back to the building its spatial structure in a contemporary way. The new building in filled vacant spaces in order to become a single entity which the remains of the palace aiming to recover its old structure by means of a discrete restoration. By shifting the circulation from the central axis to a perimeter ring, the new and the old building, the public and the private areas, as well as the ministry program and those destined for a public use, such as the library, cafeteria, exhibition hall and glazed garden were articulated. And it, 
At the same time, the new structure embodied a negotiation between all historical time collapsing in one space, the idea of stimulating and coexistence of different periods and apt overlap. Time and history have decanted in this current state, leaving a significant imprint that interacts with the original condition of the building. The new winds surround the courtyard, give it a space to the corridor and gallery that create a three-dimensional lattice, which is the structure and, text and texture interior facade at the same time. This is the three-dimensional structural geometry isolated from the whole uh, building. Using this, the image of an scaffolding, the new structure emphasized the temporary and dynamic condition of what we understand as an intervention and heritage, meaning a work in process of the operation that are carried out on the, on the existing building. Concrete columns, 25 per 25 centimeter, stiffed by diagonal elements, create a high density inner perimeter around the new courtyard. Those columns along the party wall constitute the seismic structure of the building and create a veil that we hope will help to produce a particular vision on history and time. By means of the light and shadow, reflect on the remains of the Palacio Pereira and the site of this temporal layer in coexistence. But mostly, it proposed to have a translucent lattice, a structure that allows light and air to get inside aims to reveal and not hide the view of the renal structure that is associated with it. Palacio Pereira. Uh, this is uh, our our word of our uh, Under Secretary for Cultural Heritage in Chile, Emilio de la Cerda, uh, who was in the very beginning of the conception of the project. Palacio Pereira restoration reflect an active and contemporary position regarding the issue of heritage. The project understand heritage as something that we receive, that we manage for a while, and that we then deliver enriched to future generation. The project therefore has an understanding of time, one that not only receive, but build future heritage. To do that, there is no other way than a determined commitment to quality during the time in which we live. And with the conviction that the development of complex society put more variable at stake than purely economic one, with heritage being an element and indeed an integral part of development. Thank you very much for your patience. Fabulous. Thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. And we have uh, some time for a question. So I just want to start by um, noting to the audience that if you'd like to pose some questions, we'll be monitoring the, um, the question uh, board over here in the Q&A. So just please uh, post your, post your uh, questions to the Q&A and we will, uh, we will address them and, post and read them off. Um, to the um, uh, to to Cecilia and to Paula, um, it's wonderful to hear uh, both of you go into such level of, of of detail on this one project. You know, and 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 I just really appreciate that because so often, you know, uh, presentations tend to try to cover so much and so much, so uh, so many projects, but actually cover them only superficially. So I really appreciate the opportunity to dig deep into this incredibly complex project because it is in, uh, complex both tectonically, socially, environmentally, politically, there, there are so many layers to it. So I wanna go back to where you started, which was the political situation um, under which this project has taken place. This is a moment of um, tremendous upheaval 
in um, in Chile, a new constitution. This is uh, something that doesn't happen every day, a new constitution, but also of um, uh, destruction. I mean, there has been a ton of destruction on the streets and a lot of that destruction has been targeted at, at monuments. Uh, some of them are monuments um, of figures that have um, a past that is questionable, but others have been uh, directed, some of that violence has been directed at buildings um, that are government buildings. And so you've done this incredible, delicate conservation of the facade of this building that shows us the parts that remain, the subtle differences in shade of color, or the way you treated the stucco. You give us this opportunity to read the history of this building. But of course, the history now is that if this is, this is now a canvas for, um, for spray paint and for other kinds of violence. So how do you think about that? How do you um, think about this moment in relationship to your architecture in terms of um, your own thinking about time and about the role of public buildings? This is a publicly owned monument, architectural monument. Um, how do you think the consti the new constitution how does how how is what is the role of of public building in this process do you think that this that that you at one point in your lecture you said that that history shapes our relationship to the past and clearly you're talking about architectural history buildings they shape our relationship to the past so to restate my question in a different way, um, how do you think the Palacio Pereira is going to shape the public's understanding of the nation's history? What story about the nation's history does this building tell? Well, I think this building is telling many history at the same time. Of course, one is the urban development to the east part of the city in the, in the mid of the 19th century and uh, where the, the palace was one of the elements that uh, were um, built in that, uh, in that area making some kind of bid for a development, an urban development that, that never happened actually. Mm -hmm. So somehow the building, uh, the building born in a, in, a, in a wrong place somehow. Uh, the, it was a big um, renovation in the, in the second half of the 19th century of Santiago. There were uh, uh, urban planning for the modernization of the, of the city, very strong, uh, very, uh, very powerful renovation. And so one of the main issue was that development to the, that part of the city. But that part of the city never really uh, attract the people that was supposed to uh, build in there and start to be a middle class um, area of the city uh, that uh, consolidate in the first half of the 20th century. So this palace became, and well, it was not just that one, there were several, they became a like single important element isolated from the beginning. And um, so that is one history. The other history that can uh, this building uh, talk, talk about, it's about 
the possibility of a structure from the 19th century to host different uses. This building was a family house, was also a school for girls for many years, was an institution for party, for uh, left-wing parties in the 70s, and etc. And all that uh, different program were uh, adopted by the building without really big transformation. Uh, we have to say that the big, big damage of the building was due to the, um, the last owner that was um, um, a businessman which bought the building to build a 20 floor uh, building inside the plot. So he wanted, he produced, he, he uh, promote somehow the destruction of the building. And that, uh, and the, the resilience and the, the resistance that the city uh, developed uh, protecting the building it's another very long story also. And then there is now this history of a building that started to be a private house for a very small and exclusive elite in the, in the end of the 19th century and will become a public space. It is, uh, it is renovated and all the first floor is, this, is the program is, destination, is destined for, for public program. So it become now part of the urban fabric of the public urban fabric. And in doing that, it is exposed. It is exposed at the rest of the city, as you said. And and the, the challenge today for us as architects, but also for people that is taking care of the city and heritage in Chile is very hard because there is the building and architecture and the city become some kind of, of, of um, testimony of a very precise and, 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 and critical moment in history. So, I think the moment when you came to Chile and we discussed about if it is possible to protect a building, not just putting fences and enclosing, but incorporate it to the, to the city and to make that skin at the same time as a protection layer uh, to a, a very um, welcoming um, the, the expression of the public and the, and the, and the social uh, uh, will, we thought that was, was the very important and the very interesting goal of it. And uh, of course, there is always a, 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 um, a discussion with the government. The process are very long. Well, you know very well what happened. You were in the middle of the process. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if you can, you want to say something else about that. No, I, I just will add that the, that this building has been in the public realm like for the last uh, 12 years. It has appeared in the newspaper, not just a uh, the architects or the the public, uh, the person that work in the in the government, were pushing this building to be uh, recovered, and so the, the the common people also was pushing. So in somehow, I, I think that it gives the today the building is open and and they can see uh, the effort uh, uh, what it gives to the people and and. And the idea that the, the, the building is not going to be just a, a, a building of the, the state, it's going to have a public area that is going to be part of the memory uh, of the other places in the center of uh, Santiago. I think that it gives a refresh idea of the place that you wanted to write uh, the way that we are going to live together. So instead of being in a bunker or maybe in a building that people think that is, uh, it's public but it's private in a way, I think that that can help to maybe 
uh, how do you say that, to uh, relieve tensions. Yeah. Well, that, that could <laughs> be a, wish, a wishful thinking. <laughs> we really don't know. We, uh, we think anyway, we think we have to do something. Uh, and we are thinking about that uh, with Emilio de la Cerda and all the team uh, mm. uh, who are in charge of that. Because the, 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 um, the, um, the incredible thing is that what had protected that first faces, the original color, and ev all of that was the, the, the amount of layer we have removed. So, uh, <laughs> and dust. <laughs> yes, and dust and painting, industrial painting. There were um, almost six or seven different layers that were removed with the uh, with, you know, like uh, by restore, restoration, a very careful and, and so we leave the building with its, its, its yes. build. Yeah, with absolutely naked. Mm. It has not, um, not anymore any kind of layer of protection now. So it is a big, big challenge. And, and of course, uh, we can be very radical, for example, just painting it again, and then to conserve, we have, we know what we have below, and then we paint it, and with, with that, we protect that layer, the original historical layer, or we go further, thinking of an intervention that's in, in the middle of an art, urban art operation, and protection um, artifact. And that was the idea when uh, Emilio invited you uh, to Santiago. Right. Well, it's, it's striking, you know, what I think is really amazing about this project is of course, uh, uh, this is going to be, if not already, I don't know if they've moved in already, the ministry that will oversee heritage all over Chile. So in a sense, it is a statement about the government's position on heritage and um, both the care that you've taken in the original building, but also the boldness of your intervention, of your new design, signals a kind of attitude about an embrace of contemporary architecture and indeed contemporary art within, within the realm of heritage. And I, I was really struck by the, by the clarity of your project, you know, the idea of your reconstituting the typology of this building, the courtyard that was lost because of this developer. And in a way, your project is both finished and unfinished because you use the, um, the metaphor of the scaffolding, which is... Um, of course, sends up so many memories of Yulele Duke because he described the scaffolding as as a, as an artifact of war. You know, you it's, it, its origin is in medieval siege warfare, so you put it up to both save the building but also to take it apart. So there is a kind of um, delicate nature to your project in in the and and almost you could take it away, right? It's a scaffold you put and you take away. But it's also the opposite. It's also the thing that's holding the integrity, the structural integrity of the whole building together. It, it is this most solid thing. And that, um, that double reading of, of your addition as both the most fragile and the most solid thing in the whole project oh. is to me very interesting in relationship to what you just said, which uh, uh, to what you said originally, which was, and I, this is, I'm getting to my question, which was this division you make between soft and hard materials. How do you think of a material as soft or as hard? What, what, what is that division for you? Well, first of all, I wanted to come from your, your first part of the, the presentation of the question. It's about preservation and, 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 uh, and the, and the building given to life again. And I think that the new building is what is happening, is what is, is making that happen. 
uh, the new building, uh, of course, en enlarge the surface of the of the existing um, or historical building, so allowing the the ministry to to inhabit it. Mm -hmm. So and. And that is something that has been discussed many times in, in restoration discussion and preservation about what is the better way to, to maintain, to protect, to, 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 um, to assure the, the extension of life for the, for the heritage architecture building. It's, uh, it's maintaining life in it. It's renovating, it's including all the needs uh, for contemporary uses. So to not, uh, to maintain its use on time. And I think the new building is doing that. It's, it's really giving that possibility to the remains of the old one. So that is the, the first role. And, and somehow this scaffolding is, and protection act in that way, in, in, in that um, dimension, which is contrary to the musification of the monument. You know, it's a radical uh, and opposite uh, strategy. Right. And th so that is the, the um, I think that the main, uh, a main point. And coming to the, to the differentiation of the, the different layer, um, in 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 the in the building and in the new uh, in the new structure, what we have been carefully um, developed was a structure and a material condition that at the at the same time that is dialoguing and and allowing. Uh, um, um, a connection in, in many symbolic, in, in visual and atmospheric, uh, etc. It is also um, maintaining very carefully distance and very accurate distance to the old building, which is clearly more soft than the new one. Uh, it's soft, but at the same time, it has survived for 150 years and with uh, 40 of them, uh, with an owner that wanted it to be demolished. So in, somehow this, uh, this um, um, masonry structure is a very, very strong structure. And, and we think that um, the, the performance of the building, the structural performance is one of the very important quality that has to be preserved. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, we define the material operation and the way we intervene in the different, in the different part of the building, taking care about this differentiation of quality of material and, 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 um, and um, soft and, and more hard that can be exposed and, and leave it um, in contact with the, the new. Miss, yes, um, I, I, I want to acknowledge the, what you just said, you know, and underscore what you just said about the role of the public in, uh, in, in really preserving this building, that for 30 years there was a long preservation battle to, uh, to preserve this building against the owner of the building who wanted to tear it down. And so in that sense, the public has, uh, I, I, you know, it seems to me, co-created the work with you. There is a, 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 you know, you're the architect, you gave voice to the public, but the public and preservation activists were central to this. And that story, I think, is really central to, uh, to the story of heritage. We have a question of, uh, um, concerning this uh, from the audience that I'm going to read off to you from... Um, an anonymous uh, um, attendee saying, Jonathan Hill in his text, The Architecture of Ruin, mentions that the idea of the ruin indicates that the present situation is not inevitable and implies an alternative future. 
in this context, have you speculated about the different possibilities that the Palacio Pereira will bring to future uses? I think the person is thinking about what happens if the ministry moves out? Do you, have you thought about that or is your, are you, is your building and the way you've shaped it um, a glove for the ministry that will not be able to be something else in the future? First, uh, before answering the question, I will add uh, of what you say about this public intent and a big effort of uh, of buying and and calling the the, the, the competition uh, i think that they are like the principal actors because they somehow when they call for the competition they gave to us a scope uh, a scope that define that define like a, a a new approach that at that point the, the the heritage ministries was looking for, and and, and they were sure that this building were uh, going to embrace that. So I, I will say that the all the first action of the state to buy the building, to call for an open competition, uh, to create an important. Um, a technical document which we have we can use uh, was uh, an important part of the success uh, of the result that we see together and we see right now and 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 i'm going to the the, the question of of the win i i, I will say that um it is a it is always a, a, a a continuous dialogue between what you can uh, reserve and what what you can uh, what you can find uh, that wasn't expected of what you knew from the building. And in that terms, the building is it's kind of a, a generic space. So we didn't transform the 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 the, the old building. We use the spaces uh, in, in, in the size that they were and, 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 and somehow the, the people that inhabit the building accommodate to those spaces, which in those times were quite generous on space and height. And, and, and at this, in, in, in the same way, the, the new building is, see, is, is thought as an open plan, an open plan that can change and receive a, different uses uh, whenever it's needed. So when we uh, made a competition, this was going to be the offices of, of a particular department of the Heritage Ministry. And now we can see, and, and actually it's not the first time that we see that the, the program is shift. So I, I would say that both in, in their contemporaneity are somehow generic spaces that can accommodate and have all the, today they have all the technical uh, facilities to, to reinvent itself maybe in, in a period of 100 years from now. I think that is a very important point. And, and I think that is one of the virtue of the palace. The plan is absolutely amazing. It's a very, very systematic and repetitive uh, grid with the same span in the all the spaces and in and, and a very rational organization of the site and the plot and the structural uh, performance of the brick system. So what we have done is to somehow in the, in the language of today um, possibility is to recreate our own open plan. So in the, in the 19th century building, this repetition with, a, with the span is enough big to support many different programs and enough small to really contain them in the interior spaces. And so the, the, the other side of, of our answer was in front of that, was create this open plan 
with this uh, grid of linear element in a module of 1.59 uh, meter, which came from, uh, from the facade uh, rhythm. And, uh, and that open plan, it's allowing different possibility of division, partitions, and or, or absolutely open. And so that, I think there is a new dialogue between this generic space from the 19th century and from the modern modern system open by in the in the early 20s or uh, uh, with the open plan uh, in architecture. We, we're shifting gears slightly. We have a, a technical question. Um, your project is among many many things a seismic retrofit structural seismic retrofit. And we have a question from Tim Michels, who's a, a professor in the Surf Preservation Program, who says, thank you for the fascinating presentation and for sharing so many technical details. Could you clarify the choice of a concrete diaphragm in an originally masonry and wood building? Was the concrete applied over the timber floors or were there original floor beams removed and replaced with concrete? The approach seems surprising as concrete tends to increase seismic yeah. mass and it's used therefore often strongly discouraged in unreinforced masonry. Is well, the problem linked to the Chilean seismic code descriptions for heritage you mentioned? So very technical question, but yeah but it's a very it's a very it's a, it's a key question in in the and it was for us a big big discussion because in chile we don't have we don't have actually a, a mass mass brick structure uh, regulation uh, we have a very strong we have very very strong uh, hurt, um, earthquakes earthquakes so uh, we have a very, very uh, strong uh, regulation for that. And at the beginning, what was for us, the, the main issue was to maintain the performance of the original building. But at the same time, because the, the roof and the, the floor and the beams and the plants were removed, and, and in that condition, the building has suffered several earthquakes. All the different elements, all the walls were, were disconnected. There were gaps in between the walls, sometimes bigger than 10 centimeters. So to, to, to make the building again uh, uh, work as a unit in terms of a structural uh, um, uh, response to the to the earthquake, it was absolutely needed to connect all the walls. And the only way we had was through the, the uh, ceiling and floor. So what we did was to maintain the original beams, the structural beams. The, the original uh, wood beams are, are the ones that are supported that uh, seven centimeter uh, slab of concrete that is connected to the to the um, mm -hmm. to the beam, and there is a perimeter element of concrete also, which is just um, not it, it's not a inside of it's not embedded in embedded. the so it's 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 just beside. And, and it is interrupted in each part where the beam, the, the, the wood beam connect to the original fabric of the in brick. So the, the, what we have done was to replace the one where lost of the, the original beam. We use similar uh, age uh, pieces of wood uh, so all of them were um, uh, from demolition building from the same time. So mm -hmm. to assure the same kind of performance in terms of uh, changement in the wood. And then after doing that, we built this seven centimeter um, 
element slab. and slab. Yeah. And so the building is still, the structure is still the same as it was originally. So the beams, the wood beams are those that are supported the whole thing. Yeah, but this was an important negotiation because mm. I, 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 we, in Chile, uh, the way that you would have done this is to make like a, a we said a stock, a skin like of a concrete, you know? So the, 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 the wall, the, the, this, the, this struct, the main structure of the building wouldn't work by itself it ha would have worked by the wall that cover and, 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 and cover all the walls. This is because we don't, that what our regulation asks us to do. So we, we speak uh, with our, um, with the, the engineers uh, of, the, uh, of the state and the government and, and they allow us to use the Italian um, regulation. So that is uh, which one the, the which regulation? The Italian. The, Italian. the it, you you used a different country's regulation. Yeah. Yes, we use a different country. <laughs> because how did, country how did that happen? The same uh, seismic uh, uh, behavior that Chile or similar. So they just ask us to put this uh, seven centimeter slab of concrete. So at the beginning, we, we were just uh, rebuilding the diagram, the diaphragms uh, as, uh, with the, the timber uh, beams. But uh, this was a, a requirement and, and a proposition of our engineer. Uh, well, we, we have to say that in, the, in our team, in the engineering team, we had um, a young engineer with, who was it's just awesome. arriving to Chile. And uh, his uh, PhD uh, thesis was a focus on um, mo uh, structural modeling of brick building from the 19th century. So he was part of our team and Perfect. he modeled the whole thing. He was absolutely, um, uh, he knew very, very well the regulation in Italy. He studied in there, his PhD was done there. And so he developed together with our the, the, the leader of the team of engineer Pedro Bartolome. Uh, they developed an argument, and they discussed for many time. It was a, a long discussion and a long negotiation between our engineering team and the engineering team of the government. At the end, uh, uh, that negotiation allowed us to do a very very. Uh, light uh, and, and, and unique, I would yes. I have to say, unique uh, so intervention much. in Chile using that, this uh, regulation. That's extraordinary. I've never heard of a country uh, exceptionally using the building code of another country for a particular project. We um, named <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, it speaks to both the, the, the uniqueness of this project, but maybe the next question um, is asking us to think about this project in terms of not its uniqueness, but its character as a model for the future. And the question comes from Mariana Flynn, Avila Flynn, um, uh, talking, and I read, talking about the present and future development in Chile. Do you see this project as a milestone for the future ways of approaching new construction in Chile? Well, you know, this renovation, restoration, and, and uh, I think um, probably never it can be uh, it's the first time that we have done being yeah done. and the amount of the amount of resources technical and money and so on is absolutely unique it haven't uh, happened before that but we know that this is now a very referential and very important um, uh, 
um, model for uh, facing the, the new recovering and, and, and renovation of heritage building. And not just because of the, of the technical issue, which was the first time uh, that in Chile, one of the building were, um, were uh, faced as a archeological recovering. It was really, uh, uh, but also because uh, the, the way it interact uh, with contemporary architecture and contemporary technique. I think in the both level, the technical and the architectonic and tempo and, and, and symbolic and so on, this building is really uh, making a statement. And a statement that is, as you said before, is a statement um, done by the government uh, because they were the one who defined the rules for this competition. And those elements were already um, defined somehow in the basis of the, of the competition. So it's not us to make the statement. We just, well, we, it, yeah, we it, as well. it was a public statement. And, and I think for them, this is absolutely a key issue uh, today in Chile. Well, I mean, one of the things that I uh, noticed right away with your project and your practice, I think more generally in all your projects, is the interdisciplinary character of it. How uh, open you are, and in fact, how integral it is for you to work with different kinds of people, different kinds of minds. Uh, you put together these incredible teams of, you find these people that are uh, you know, like this engineer that you're describing, um, but you're also very attuned to the public and and the needs of the public, um, and that that gives a kind of clarity to the project because you 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 use the word decanting, mm -hmm. you use the word decanting the kind of uh, moment, um, and. I wanted to ask you maybe one last, I mean, there's so much we could talk about, but there's um, one last question that I, I wanted to ask you about that um, the, the organic life as opposed to the inorganic life in the building. I couldn't help but notice these plants, these um, the inside of the, of the um, gallery spaces. And uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about those. Um, you, as I recall, you had cut some holes on the floor of the building to make room for the plants. And so why, why did you do that? What well, were you after? You know, for us, um, what was really a, a big challenge and also very exciting for us was to identify on the ruin which were the opportunities that the, 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 the stage of the ruin uh, allow us to understand other possibilities for the building, other times, other, other understanding also. And one of them very important, of course, was the floor. The, 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 there was not any kind of pavement, there was the earth, and yes, soil. soil, yes. And so that allowed us to understand the structure of the building absolutely differently if the, the soil, the, the, the pavement were already done, where you can really understand a collection of rooms and not a pattern, uh, a three dimensional pattern uh, as it is. And, and the other was the somehow the, the nature that, that were invading the, the ruin. When we arrived there at the beginning, there were trees on the building, three big tree, I mean, uh, 10 meters trees inside because the, the, the degree of abandonment and, and uh, was so big that nobody had cut that tree and grow and grow and grow. 
And at the same time, we had a lot of uh, images from the early 20s, early, early the, the beginning of the 20th century with about this uh, gallery, this transept, which was full of big um, pots yes. and with palm and exotic uh, plants on it. So what we did was to intensify that condition. So somehow there is something that is coming from the earth that arose in the space. And then there are other that can be removable inside. And we are making some kind of memory or some kind of remembering about this condition of nature that, that never stop, uh, that energy is in there, is in the earth, waiting for a moment to grow. And, and the palace allow that, the, the ruins allow that. And so we keep it. And, and, and that is one of the reasons for that. But the winter garden the, 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 um, was, in, there, yeah. was there, yeah. uh, that, that uh, and, and, and also the idea of uh, shifting the circulation from this cross-section transit, the, the idea to give in, this is kind of the key and uh, the key piece of uh, not just the palace, maybe of the building that connect everything. But, but not in terms of circula circulation, uh, more in terms of lives, yeah, in, in the way that you live, in, in the kind of thing that can happen, in the conversation, in the public the spaces. So we want to embrace that uh, as well. And adding plant uh, will maybe stop uh, any intention of reconverting that space in a just uh, circulation area. You it's know that there the was uh, uh, the fact that all the the rooms around the precinct around this gallery uh, had lost or all, all their um, their um, ornamental surfaces, ceilings, uh, walls, etc. Made that element, this cross shape full of ornamental uh, texture as a, a clear precinct. So it was like a single element that we, through this uh, perimeter circulation, we isolated from the, the circulation, from, from the, the programmatic performance that was uh, in, in its beginning, in the, in the original uh, concept of Luciano. And, and we made that to give to this space a positive, um, a positive role. So now it has its own uh, character, it has its own cl climate, it has its own um, humidity, it has its own, uh, you know, it, it offers its own experience. And you can close it, you can, you can use it in different way, but the building will, will continue function because the circulation were shifted to the perimeter. So that are the, the, the arguments for, for that. It's wonderful the way, I mean, you know, so many architects, when they work on a historic building, the first thing they do is change the front door. And it's so nice that you kept the front door, but, but then you rearrange the movement around the building right after you come in through the front door to allow for the use of these spaces in different ways. And it's magical. I mean, the, 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 both, you talk about juxtaposition, but there, there are these different atmospheres in the new and the old, and yet they seem to speak to one another in such a such a poetic way. The light, I think, is what really brings them together. The way you manage to bring the light into that court where the, you know, the galleries, the winter garden, and then the kind of summer garden that you created in the courtyard in the back is, is, is really striking. It's important also to, to know that this, uh, this um, element in the building, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a very important cl climate Climate, so yeah, climate, yeah. climate artifact. 
it's a, it's an active element mm. that's open, closed. There are different layer of shadows to control. So it it's it has a very strong role in terms of uh, efficiency, in terms of consumption of energy, and so that is also one of the issues that uh, explain why we choose to put inside in there to maintain, let's say, the green uh, that was originally and then in the in the ruin moment of the building. Do you see your building as a as a way to a um, is as a technology for climate control? Do you see as a kind of uh, a way of adapting the, the 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 climate to the climate? I mean, it's, it's a very passive building. Uh, I, I I will say technology, but it's a passive building. The, we have like uh, air condition or just in the new building and heating just in the inside part of the old building, not in the, in this, in the transit, there is no, any kind of injection of hot or cold air. So I, I will say that somehow the, the pre-existing building uh, push us to a passive approach uh, as well, uh, ju not just in the old building, but also in the new building, with the understanding the courtyard as well as, a, a, as a, with the same performance as the transit. Of course, that that uh, means that we had to re redesign the roof of the transept. The roof today is a very technical uh, element that has opening and control, uh, light control, solar control, etc. Because uh, it, it, it acts as a uh, buffer in terms of climate from the outside to the interior spaces around this element. Um, we have a, a, a number of questions here. I've obviously, we don't have time for all of them, but would you like to take uh, one last question or Yes, of course. You still yeah. have energy? Okay. So, um, uh, th th it's one that... 30 minutes. We have, uh, in Chile, we have the... Curfew in 30 minutes. Oh, you have curfew? Oh, my God. Well, then, well, then we'll make it... We'll make it... No, no, no. Well, we, we'll are take a, a couple of um, we are totally um, reluctant to the... <laughs> This is, in a way, a um, appropriate, then. It's a question by Alonso Maldonado, and um, he's asking about uh, how... What you did in this heritage site, um, what in your i mean i'm i'm reading i'm paraphrasing a little bit what in your work is is attempting to make a connection with the people how are you you know how is your preservation design work trying to connect to people and i think he means the public here uh in the context of this social crisis in Chile, is there something about the building that is trying to connect with the public? You know, um, I, I think we as architects, when we work in the public, which Paula and I have participated in several public projects, we have a responsibility to give the high standard of design, high standard of solution, high standard of um, of possibility, and I think that is the is something that is really really important. Even if if there is a risk, even if we will have to take uh, some kind of temporary um, precautions um, and maybe some do some operation in the facade and some kind of protection element. But uh, but what the project and 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 I think it's not just us as architect but also the the government who who lead the, the, the whole project and give the resources for us, for that is 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 to give is to offer to the city to the people to the citizen 
the higher standard space possible it, with the resources, of course, and technical um, possibilities we have. And I think that for me, that is maybe the most important issue. And that is what move us uh, and, 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 and stimulate us in our work. And, and there are not other kind of consideration. I think that is, is quite an issue for, for all the designer and architect today. In a way, as always, you raise the standard to, and ask us to think about the public as not just the people that are alive today, but to, to, to think about the people that are yet to come. And yes. that standard is there to, 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 to meet them and to receive them and to encounter them. So it's just been such a pleasure to, to listen to your presentation, a real privilege um, to hear you think through your project and uh, I just want to offer our, our deep appreciation in the name of the school and, and the preservation program, um, our gratitude for sharing your knowledge and experience with us uh, across North and South. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. Thanks again for joining us. Thank Thanks you. Thanks to you for inviting and thank everybody that is now listening to us.